this is the November, <laughs> October 19th, uh, 2022 meeting of the Boulder County Planning Commission. Uh, we'll now come to order. This is our first attempt at a hybrid meeting, so uh, we're still testing out some systems, so we request and appreciate your patience. Um, so we'll start with a roll call. Uh, if we want to just go down the line, starting with Gavin. Gavin McMillan. Dave Shu. Sam Fitch. Mark Bloomfield. Sam Libby. Chris Whitney. Connor Canaday. Okay. So the first agenda item uh, is approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? We've got two copies uh, of the minutes this time, so. Let's see, I guess we'll start with the September 1st, 2022 minutes. Any modifications or comments on those? Does anybody have a motion? I move that we approve the minutes from the September 1st, 2022 meeting. Second. Okay. So Kim, do we need to do a roll call vote as well? Or can we just do a... Kim Sanchez, I would um, recommend doing a roll call vote um, just because we have people that may be joining by phone that might okay. not be able to see you. Okay. And just a reminder to try to speak directly into the mic and as closely as you can because it's a little hard to pick up, we're finding, when you're um, viewing virtually. So as close as you can get, the better it is for hearing when you're online. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Gavin. Aye. David. Aye. Sam. Aye. Mark. Aye. Sam. Aye. Uh, Chris. Aye. And Connor. Aye. Okay. Uh, so and then we'll go to the September, what was that, September 21st uh, minutes. Do we have any modifications or a motion? Commissioner Libby, I move that we approve the minutes for September 21st. I have a second. Commissioner Renee, second. Okay. Gavin? Aye. David? Aye. Sam Fitch? Aye. Mark? Aye. Sam Libby? Aye. Chris Whitney? Aye. Connor Canaday? Aye. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we have any staff updates? Yes, Kim Sanchez, Deputy Director of Community Planning and Permitting. First, just wanted to welcome you for our first hybrid hearing. So very excited to have the planning commissioners here in person in the third room courthouse, third floor courthouse at the um, courthouse building off of Pearl Street. Um, today's hearing will be in person for staff and the planning commissioners, and then we still have the public attending virtually. But the plan is for the first um, hearing that the public will attend in person to be October 27th. So you can expect that the next planning commission hearing, which is November 15th, I believe, um, hopefully we'll have public um, attend in person, um, barring any major glitches. Um, so just also want to, um, in addition to the thanks, recognize Anna and Rick, who have really been instrumental in um, making sure that things go smoothly. Um, they are both perfectionists, and so I expect that things will run well today. But if they don't, and we have something that happens, we just ask for people's patience as we're testing out this new system. So thank you, and glad to see you all in person. Thanks, Kim. Thank and definitely thanks to Anna and Rick for getting this all set up. Uh, it also explains why there's no members of the public here. I didn't know that we were <laughs> that we weren't having members of the public today. Uh, okay, so we've got two docket items. Uh, the first docket item is docket DC 22-0002, proposed land use code text amendment to 4-516.k access accessory uh, solar energy systems and Hannah Hipley and Andrea Vaughn 
looks like maybe only Andrea. Hannah will not be here today. I will okay. be presenting to you. Great. Go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Andrea Vaughn, a staff planner with Community Planning and Permitting, and I am here today to discuss docket DC-22002, Accessory Ground Mounted Energy Systems, Tax Amendments to Article 4-51K of the Boulder Land Use Code to provide an alternative path for the development of accessory ground mounted solar and other changes to the code necessary to integrate the text amendment. The Boulder County Land Use Code has identified two types of solar uses in the code. The first is the utility use, more associated with solar farms. These tend to be large energy systems that generate energy for distribution and are approved through either a special use or site plan review. The second is the accessory energy system, which will be the discussion of, our of, our, uh, of these text amendments today. These are small energy systems that typically serve just a single use, such as a residence, and all of these systems are approved through site plan review waiver. This proposed text amendment intends to address the review process for these accessory systems. To demonstrate what we are discussing today, the utility use you will see on the left is a solar farm. These tend to be larger in intensity and scale. And on the right, you have a ground-mounted system, something similar to what you might see in Boulder County. And again, these tend to be much smaller in use and scale. Site plan review waiver for these accessory systems was first adopted in 2019 if the projects met the following parameters. <clears throat> Maximum height of 15, the system must comply with the zoning set district setbacks and have a disturbed area of less than half an acre. The intent of this was to use a site-specific analysis, also known as site plan review waiver, to mitigate the visual and environmental resource impacts of solar development. However, since 2019, staff has built a wealth of knowledge concerning the developments of these systems and their impacts. This text amendment is intended to provide an alternative path for accessory ground-mounted solar that would not require a site plan review waiver for projects meeting a defined set of parameters. These parameters are meant to mitigate the visual and environmental impacts. In order to create this alternative path, the text is in, is in need of amendment. It is staff's belief that the proposed amendment maintains the intent of the code while also scaling the review. By including a set of parameters that outlines acceptable levels of impact in the code, Staff can remove low-level impact projects from requiring a site-specific analysis, allowing staff to allocate time and resources to projects that are more likely to impact resources. One of the goals of this project was to find a way to scale the level of review from what is required in the code and more closely align it to what we see being permitted. For example, in the code, we see that uh, projects may not have more than half an acre of disturbed area. But what we were seeing coming through our building permitting is that these actually have much less than a tenth of an acre of disturbed area. Additionally, the code calls for a maximum height of 15 feet, but our analysis shows that these systems typically have a median height of eight and a half feet. Modifications to 4-516K.2 have been proposed as highlighted on your screen and clarify when site plan review will be required. And then on this slide, you can see where in 4-516K, these new provisions are being added to the code. In the following slide, we will, slides, we will review subsections E, F, and G in more detail. Provision one of subsection E states that the height of the system does not exceed 10 feet. Staff had identified uh, further limiting the height of these systems to help mitigate the visual impacts of solar development. Additionally, in our analysis, we found that 81% of the approved systems were 10 feet or less in height. Provision two of subsection E states that the system complies with applicable zoning setbacks these setbacks help create consistent development patterns, and if for any reason the setbacks are to be encroached, then those systems should continue to be analyzed through the site-specific review. Provision three of subsection E states that the panels of the system are located within 100 feet of the use the system is accessory to, such as a single-family dwelling or agricultural facility. 
as measured from the furthest extent of the panels to the closest point of the structure or facility that the system is providing power to. And there on the right, you can see an example of how we do the, of how we are proposing these measurements. By placing these systems adjacent to existing development, this will help achieve the impact mitigation goals of this project by locating new development in or near already impacted areas. Provision four of subsection E states that the cumulative panel area does not exceed 750 square feet. Staff has identified panel area as another method of mitigating those impacts. This is also a simple approach um, where applicants can, that applicants can show on a site plan and staff can easily review. Through our analysis, we also found that 71% of analyzed permits were of this size or smaller, and we believe that this reflects the scale of the projects that we are seeing. Moving on to subsection F, subsection F states that prior to final inspection, all areas of exposed or disturbed soil must be restored through revegetation or other means sufficient to prevent the establishment of noxious weeds, soil erosion, and to protect stormwater quality. And finally, we have subsection G, which states that ground-mounted systems shall remain subject to explicit limitations that were imposed on a property <clears throat> through a prior county land use approval or conservation easement. These prior land use agreements could be something such as a building envelope that had been on, placed on a platted property. These two subsections are often included as conditions of approval through site plan review waiver. However, since the proposal that we are discussing today is to remove these projects from site plan review waiver, we are including these subsections to codify the requirements. In order to integrate the new subsection, Article 4-802 is also in need of amendment so that projects meeting subsection E may be exempt from site plan review waiver. And here on the screen, you can see in Article 4-802 where that is being fit into and it being amended in uh, C.7. During the drafting of these, uh, of these proposed amendments, community engagement was included with a virtual community meeting as well as a month-long referral process. Staff had solicited feedback from Boulder County residents, solar installers, HOAs, and energy companies. Staff has not received any comments expressing concern or conflict. With these clearly defined parameters, applicants can begin to design their projects to meet these standards and it is anticipated that our department will begin to see a reduction in the amounts of these projects that, will, that are being processed through site plan review waiver. Staff believes that these amendments are in accordance with the comprehensive plan and it beats, these amendments further the county's sustainability goals. And as discussed in this presentation, as well as in the staff report, we have found that the criteria for a text amendment to be met. Staff recommends that Planning Commission approves and recommends to the Board of County Commissioners approval of docket DC 22-0002, these text amendments to Article 4-516, Accessory Ground Mounted Energy Systems. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question to start off. <clears throat> um, on the area, it seems like that's a projected area. In other words, the, the area on the ground, not a panel area. Is that accurate? So uh, for our analysis, the best we were able to do were measurements from um, aerial photographs. Right. Um, but we, are ask we will be asking applicants to include that, uh, the definitive panel area. So is the, I forget what the limit was now, but is that limit, um, is that actual panel area? That is actual panel area. Okay. Um, I think it might be helpful to actually uh, specify that just so that it's clear. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bloomfield. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions? Is it, <coughs> Sam Fitch. 
Um, my only question was in the data analysis section of the staff report, uh, the recommendation for maximum panel, panel area is 750, and there are relatively small number of uh, things that are really large, so 1,700 and up to 2,000 and over. Uh, can you give us some examples of what would be at that extra, at the high end, that is the non-excluded from site plan review process, of what those specifically were or what they would look like compared to the 750 re re recommendation? Commissioner Fitch, if I am understanding your question correctly, you are asking in what instances might somebody look to install these larger panels as opposed to maybe something at 750 square feet or less? Uh, the, well, the question is, uh, again, is what the reasoning behind cut, putting the threshold, the balancing act that you're doing with this at 750 and not saying 1,000 or so we did, uh, in our analysis, we did come to the conclusion that 750 square feet does seem to meet the majority's needs in this in solar installation, um, as well as it helps, it helps to mitigate those visual impacts by keeping these smaller, as well as requiring them to be closer to the home. Okay. The visual impacts are um, something that we do look at through the site plan review waiver process. And so the larger the panel, the more impact the potential is. And so when we're moving these from the site plan review waiver process, we were hoping to keep these relatively small but still meet the needs of Boulder County residents. Uh, my suggestion would be that when you take this to the commissioners, uh, that you have some examples of actual photos of particular sites to say, here's what the 750 limit would look like. Here's what something double that would look like. Here's the biggest one we've reviewed, and here's what it actually looks like. So again, this is clearly a judgment process about where the where the boundary should be. Thank you, Commissioner Fitch. I just ask one follow-up question to that. If someone did have a proposal with a, say, 1,000 square foot array, the, what is the path for them asking for that as opposed to um, something that meets the requirements? They would have to go through the site plan review waiver process where staff would then analyze the proposal okay. um, at that site specific level. So the, the same as it is right now, essentially. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, this process isn't <coughs> amending site plan review the site plan review waiver process. It is just trying to find a, um, an alternative path to help residents m more easily install solar. Sure. And then, um, Another question was related to the proximity of the array to the house, and I think you landed on 100 feet. And I guess um, I'm curious to hear what, what you think the intent of, like, why why is it desirable to keep the array close to the house as opposed to maybe, I don't know, just hypothetically there's a, a better solar location on the site that gets better sun exposure, and maybe it's, maybe it's even, you know, shaded from, from view. and. Um, what are the goals of that proximity thing, I guess, or what's the idea behind it? So that is in part a uh, to limit the visual impacts as well as the ground resources. Um, staff believes that 100 feet is pretty adequate to try to limit the impact to, um, to natural resources on site. Mm -hmm. um, so from the existing development, we anticipate that there might be uh, impacts that have reached that far out or at the very least, it kind of clusters those new, those new impacts. Got it. Okay. If I can, <clears throat> excuse me, if I can follow up on that, um, I just had this thought, so I don't know if it's somewhere in there. Um, was that from the primary residence, or is that from any, like if you have an outbuilding, can it be within 100 feet of the outbuilding? If it is powering the outbuilding. So it's 100 feet <laughs> to whatever structure it is powering. Um, that's to help limit the trenching. Uh, that's right. where we see a lot of the impacts to natural resources. Um, so if, say, you had a shed and you, for one reason or another, wanted to power that with solar, 
then that would need to be within 100 feet. Of the shed. Of the shed. So if, let's say, you've got your primary residence, you've got some outbuildings behind it, and you want to put the solar past the all of those outbuildings and it's more than 100 feet, then you could go through site review then, and then still, still do that. Mm -hmm. It's just not a slam dunk. Right. The intent isn't to limit uh, the options that applicants have, but instead to just provide a clear path to building permit. I had a question about the uh, item F on the provisions. So that applies to all accessory use solar requests, right? Um, I'd like to hear more about the reasoning behind the addition of that, as that seems contrary to um, the primary intent of this revision, which is to ease the process of that waiver process. Um, F is, is applying to the uh, revegetation of areas that we've seen issues with disturbances not being revegetated. My other question for that is, is that defined elsewhere in the code? Like, do you have to have actual vegetation grown back to get your final approval now? Or is it saying you've shown effort towards that? I don't want to have this, you know, extend the inspection process by that not being finalized. Um, Deputy Director Kim Sanchez may be able to speak better towards our escrow process. Um, but this subsection F is a condition of approval that we do see through site plan review waiver. Um, so it's not uncommon for what we are requiring of applicants today, okay. um, this just codifies it. Understood. Yeah, I, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. That okay. was a, a good follow-up. Thank you. This is Commissioner Shu. So uh, you mentioned visual impacts and then um, environmental resource impacts. Can you give examples of what those environmental resource impacts could be or have been? I do not have a specific example at hand. But I would imagine uh, the trench, I, there uh, is often grading and trenching activities associated uh, with the installation of solar. And so it may be disruptive to habitats um, as well as other resources that we do look at through the waiver process. Okay, and then for, for that, of the four um, requirements then the within 100 feet is that really the only one that addresses that type of impact i guess that's the only one that's being trenched yeah. uh i apologize commissioner shu if i'm understanding your question correctly are you asking if that is the only provision that addresses the uh, impacts to environmental resources yes no we have also identified that the panel area um, in our current processes, uh, the d total disturbed area also includes the area underneath the panel as the installation uh, and the permanent residency of the panels we believe may have impacts as well. So if the area under the panel is disturbed, what, I mean, you know, I have grass or dirt and I build a panel, what are we talking about the impact that the grass dies or what is the environmental resource impact that we're trying to protect with this panel area? I unfortunately do not have that answer at hand. Um, okay, and then I guess with the 100 feet, um, are there instances where you have something within 100 feet and then the cumulative area is greater than 750 square foot that's existing? I do believe that we had those. I don't have those examples at hand. Uh, we did do an analysis of almost 130 permits when we were going through this, uh, and these were the these were the provisions that we we recommended. Yeah, thank you, Kim Sanchez. I can help answer the other question. Part of it is that we want to try to reduce the amount of land disturbance that's occurring. So that's in our comp plan. It's in our all our other sets of regulations. There may not be. Um, significant adverse impacts unless it's going through a riparian area, um, some sort of wildlife habitat that has been mapped. But in general, we like to try to keep the topography to the natural topography without much disturbance if we can, if we can get there. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions for staff? 
Yes, this is uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, in the presentation, this is maybe a clarifying question. In the presentation, uh, one of the earlier slides, uh, you had mentioned the 10-foot height restriction. Um, was there a caveat there that, it, for the sake of efficiency, that there is allowable to increase that height? Not through this process. This process is intended to uh, provide a speedy review. And so by doing that, we've identified that there are these provisions that must be met and all must be met. Um, if one falls out of those, then they are required to go through the site plan review waiver process. Okay, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Fitch, but I, I would re-emphasize that the uh, site review waiver process is still a staff process rather than a special use site-specific plan review. Staff does do site visits for these uh, site plan review waiver, and they do take into account many of the similar things that we take that we do uh, through site plan review or special use, just usually on a um, on a shorter timeline. So, if somebody had a particular site specific need for something for a twelve foot height limit, they could just go through staff to do that. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Shu again. I'm, I'm going to ask a question that I don't know if you can answer, but as far as the Boulder Valley, or the comprehensive plan, um, the county comprehensive plan goes, um, you know, there are climate goals. Um, how do those weigh in priority compared to other goals like environmental resource management? Is that a just a subjective balancing act or are climate goals? emphasized beyond other goals? Through this process, we didn't really weigh any one comp comprehensive plan goal over another. We looked to find a way that they could be harmonized. Any other questions? Okay. So now, <clears throat> comment. Um, Anna, do we have anybody signed up to speak? This is Anna Milner's staff. We don't have anyone currently signed up to speak. If you are interested in speaking, please enter your name and address in the chat. We also see one person dialed in by phone. If the phone call-in listener would like to speak, please press star 9 to raise your hand. Let us know. Okay. We'll give that a minute. Do you see anyone signing up, Anna? This is Anna Milner's staff. I don't believe we have anyone signed up to speak to this item today. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Or public comment, excuse me. Um, okay, so then we're up to discussion. Anybody have anything they want to discuss? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start, Commissioner Whitney. Um, so actually prior to joining Planning Commission, I had looked into exactly this bit of code for a while because I was looking at maybe building a solar carport. And the realities of that is that it's often, it's not only because of site plan review, but also just because of the engineering requirements around wind load and all of that, it's much harder to build ground mount than it is to, to just do it on top of the building. Uh, so I think anything we can do to make that uh, more of a possibility, especially if your structures are shaded by trees or other things and there's a better location for your solar. I think anything we can do to make that, that process easier is, is definitely a win. And hopefully by also removing some of the uh, site plan review waiver requirements, we can encourage local solar builders to have preset uh, structures and carports and things like that because there'll be, more, there'll be less requirements for them to have to meet in order to, to sell that kind of a preset system. 
Thanks, Commissioner Bloomfield. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I'm certainly all in favor of anything to reduce staff time and reduce uh, the difficulty of going through any kind of process like this. So, does anybody else have any thoughts? This is Commissioner Hsu. Um, I, you know, I also favor making things easier. Um, you know, I, I would like to be even easier than what's proposed here. Uh, I think, you know, the climate crisis is very important, and we should really weigh that priority more than um, undefined environmental resource impacts, um, and then, you know, visual impacts. That seems to be the primary reason for all four criteria, and I feel like that's, you know, you have one for it. You know, setbacks, height. Uh, within 100 feet, um, cumulative area, like all those are basically for visual. And yeah, you know, some people don't like them, but there is a climate crisis going on. We need more solar. Um, at the same time, I'm not going to let perfect be the enemy of the good. So, you know, I think this is better. Um, I would like to be even more aggressive in, well, um, more lax in allowing, um, getting out of site plan review. Commissioner Libby, I'll just uh, add to that. I, I agree, Dave, and um, I would be, I think this is easy to support for us and a great uh, great improvement of the regulations. I would be interested in similar information around the utility scale solar uh, code conditions that are there, seeing how many have gone through and been requested, what that kind of burden is. Uh, residential solar is well and good, but to make a big difference, we need the utility scale ones. So um, if there's a chance to have a discussion or session around that in the future, that'd be of interest. I'm not sure that code is what's holding that up, more land use availability and interest, but uh, that would be the bigger difference maker. It's Commissioner Rennie, and just maybe for context, uh, I was doing a little bit of napkin math uh, during this. I think for 750 square foot panel size, it's like 36 panels and like a 14 plus kilowatt system, uh, which for, for residential, that's a pretty, pretty sizable system. Um, so if that helps provide context, just kind of on what that square footage would actually mean. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, David, I'm curious, uh, given that we're making a recommendation to the county commissioners, uh, like what what would you see would be the, the more lax um, option that you would support? I mean, are you talking about like 150 feet instead of 100, you know, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I mean, the like Commissioner Fitch pointed out, cumulative area at 750 square feet, you know, there's, it's not like a very, there's a long distribution tail there and 750 seems to be getting the part of it and we can move that. Um, the 100 feet within the residence that only, I think, captured 47% of the existing um, um, systems right now. So, you know, everything else uh, was capturing I wrote down 71% or 80% for 81% for a cumulative area and height specifically, respectively. Um, so, you know, within 100 feet, that could be extended out as well. <coughs> okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm certainly in favor of, of what you're talking about in terms of making it a little bit more lax. I'm seeing some, some other nods. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I, I don't and again I don't want it to to get in the way of, of approval but um, maybe we do an <coughs> approval with actually we could make it a little bit more uh, a little bit more lax to again I'm I'm all in favor of reducing reducing pressure on staff they've got a lot of important things to do um, and then encouraging people to do solar and and making it easy I don't know if you just said this, Dave, um, but it looks like if we were to propose or recommend extending to 150 feet from the structure it's powering, that adds about 25% of the past um, applicants. So that would be a substantial amount of increased um, like applications for what I would see as not a substantial increase in like a visual disturbance. I would agree with that. Are there any other areas we want to look at extending, or is that good enough to make a motion? I think we all seem agreed on that. As a yeah, the only other one I would weigh in on is perhaps height. Um, you know, for one foot of height to have to then go through a separate process if you wanted 11 feet, 
you know, I don't know. I, I did look at the data, and, and by the way, thank you for putting the data together. It really helps to have the discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, um, what's it? Here's a question for you, actually. What is the accessory structure height limit like for a shed or something like that? Off of the top of my head, I do not have that answer, but. Um, it, okay. In the in the existing provisions, there's a accessory limit to 15 feet for panels or 25 feet if it's required for some location-based piece. So, for actually so for item, item C in that existing accessory use, I think, defines 15 feet as a max. Okay. Which, with the ability to be higher than that, as a proof of the review. Got it. Kim Sanchez, it's actually 12 feet for um, without a building permit. So as long as your shed or accessory structure is less than 12 feet and does not have electricity, so there aren't utility hookups to it, then it does not need a building permit. Otherwise, the height limitations would just be what um, are the height limitations for a zoning district. Got it. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Libby, sorry, I was referring to the panels, just to be clear. Yeah, that's yeah, two, diff two different height limits. Thank you. So it sounds like... 12 feet is allowed for accessory dwellings. That seems like a reasonable. Yeah, I, I would support solar as well. I would support moving to, to 12, so it can be as tall as the minimum height allowed on site for other structures, and I, I would be comfortable pushing that forward. Mm -hmm. Generally in agreement with that. <clears throat> have a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion. It's Commissioner Libby. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission recommends to the Board of County Commissioners approval of docket DC-22-0002, land use code text amendment related to accessory solar energy systems, with the recommendation that item E.1 be changed to 12 feet as the maximum height of the system for this process, and E.3 be changed to 150 feet as the distance from the uh, primary, uh, the accessory use uh, structure that it is accessory to. Commissioner McMillan, I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, I would, Commissioner Fitch, I would just recommend that when it goes to county commissioners, you pursue that step of uh, presenting some visuals about what it would imply to uh, expand the panel area from 750 square feet to 1,000 square feet. And I'll just add the, the clarification of panel area. Um, okay, uh, let's go for a vote. Start with uh, Connor. This is Commissioner Candidate, aye. Commissioner Rennie, aye. Commissioner Libby, aye. Commissioner Bloomfield, aye. Commissioner Fitch, aye. Commissioner Shu, aye. Commissioner McMillan, aye. Okay, that is unanimous. So we will move on. I believe we're taking a break until 3 p.m. At which we'll, at which point we'll reconvene for a study session with the commissioners. That's exactly right. We're, we moved a little bit quicker than we expected, so we'll just recess until 3 p.m. when we meet for the joint work session. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ruthless efficiency. Thank you.
size like a and you can actually make it bigger. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, planning commissioners and board of county commissioners. Um, I'm Kim Sanchez, deputy director, community planning and permitting. We have um, already convened this afternoon for a public hearing of the planning commission. And now we are lucky enough to have the board of county commissioners, all three commissioners are joining us today for a joint work session with the planning commission and board of county commissioners together um, in person to talk about short-term and vacation rentals and get feedback from you. So I think we'll start today by just going um, around the dais and, and having folks introduce themselves since this may be the first time that you've actually met in person. So we'll do that and then once we complete the introductions, um, Ethan Abner on our staff will lead you through some information and we plan to have a, a pretty hearty discussion with you. Look forward to your feedback, thank you. Sure, hi, I'm Gavin McMillan, been a planning commissioner since 2017. Dave Shue, planning commissioner since uh, beginning of 2021. Uh, Sam Fitch, I can't remember how long I've been on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Bloomfield, I've uh, been on since 2017. Good afternoon, Martha Luchman, Boulder County Commissioner. And Claire Levy, Boulder County Commissioner. Matt Jones, Boulder County Commissioner. Sam Libby, Planning Commissioner. I live in Longmont. Chris Whitney, Planning Commissioner, and this is my first year on Planning Commissioner. And uh, my name is Connor Canada, Planning Commissioner, and I also started in 2022. Great, thank you all. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Ethan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Ethan Abner. I'm a long range planner with Community Planning and Permitting. Um, today I'm going to be uh, w walking you through some information about short-term dwelling and vacation rentals. Um, since this is an informational item, uh, we're not requesting any action at this time and we're not taking public comment during the meeting. Uh, I just want to note that we're kind of in the beginning stages of this review. Um, and so what we're going to be walking through are some applications that we had a chance to look at up to a certain period. Um, it may not include those new applications, and I'll go through that when we get more into the presentation. Um, and this is just a piece of the overall review. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so resolution 2020 2020-104 approving docket DC TAC 19 TAC 0005 uh, requires that the efficacy of the land use code proposed amendments must be reviewed within two years of adoption, but no sooner than one year following full implementation. The criteria and metrics for review must be established as part of the implementation plan. So today, like I said, um, first I'm gonna provide you with some background on short-term rentals just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, then I'll provide some information about the land use review processes that we use for these rentals um, and uh, walk through some of the applications. After that, I, I hope to kind of have a discussion with you all and get your feedback um, since you were policymakers and decision makers about how this land use process is working, um, what, your, you know, what your thoughts are and anything that we might be able to take a look at during this review. Um, and then I'll talk about kind of the next steps where we go from, from there. So as far as criteria go, we've, we've established three criteria. Um, just as a reminder, the 2019 text amendments were focused on kind of preventing uh, the loss of housing stock and increasing housing affordability, uh, balancing the benefits and burdens of short-term rentals on the community, and improving enforcement mechanisms. Um, we've divided the review into three kind of categories uh, that focus on the land use code, the licensing ordinance, and the zoning enforcement. Uh, today we're gonna be specifically talking about the land use code. Um, but as far as the land use code goes, the way we've kind of defined the criteria um, is are the regulations in the land use code meeting the intent of policymakers uh, do decision makers have sufficient guidance to make decisions and are the existing levels of review appropriate? For the licensing ordinance, we're going to be looking at the, making sure the existing licensing requirements are appropriate, verifiable, and promote desired safety standards. And then finally, for zoning enforcement, uh, proactive enforcement to achieve compliance with land use code and licensing ordinance. Um, we're going to continue throughout this process to gather uh, public uh, comment. 
additional data, do some more research, analyze current regulations, uh, et cetera. And we, we anticipate holding a um, public meeting on the two-year review in December 2022 or January 2023 with the Board of County Commissioners, um, at which time you all might initiate uh, changes to the land use code or the licensing ordinance. So just to kind of, since we're gonna be talking about the land use code criteria, I want you to be aware of what that criteria or what the metrics for that criteria kind of look like. The metrics, even though we're not gonna be discussing zoning enforcement and um, licensing today, the metrics are kind of similar. I just want you to have a sense. Um, but again, that criteria is on the left, how we've kind of defined that. And then those metrics that we might use throughout this review um, to assess that is on that right side under metrics. Um, so they're both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, we might take a look at the, the time frame that these reviews are taking uh, from a land use review perspective. Um, we're gonna look at the number that have been approved or denied. Uh, and then we're gonna do some more qualitative things like we're doing today where we talk with you all about how you, proceed, how you think the land use code is working, how the process is working, what you're hearing, um, things like that. And we'll meet with the public to, to talk about that as well. And, um, continue, like I said, doing research to identify trends in ours and then see what other jurisdictions might be doing because things may have changed since the last update. Um, so just to start off, uh, there are, you know, these are the short-term rental types, some of the short-term rental types. Uh, we have the primary dwelling short-term rental. There is no land use review process required for that type of rental and it is permitted in all zoning districts. Uh, we also have the secondary dwelling short-term rental, which are those secondary dwellings. They're not the primary dwelling of the, the property owner. Um, and they can be rented for less than 60 nights a year. Um, those are approved through limited impact special use review or limited impact special use review waiver. And those are also permitted in all districts. Finally, we have the vacation rental. Those are those rentals that are going to be rented for more than um, 60 nights a year. Uh, there are two processes for these, these rentals depending on, uh, you know, if it's going to be on less than five acres of unsubdivided land in certain zoning districts, or if it's going to be on more than five acres uh, on cer in certain zoning districts. Um, and so it can either go through the special use review process or the limited impact special use review process. Um, again, that depends on what zone we're in and, and what the size of the, the land is. Um, those are not permitted in subdivisions and there are other zoning districts that vacation rentals are just not permitted in. So just to provide a little bit of background about the applications that we took a look at, we established a cutoff period of September 15th for this first review. Um, this allowed us to review, even though there were 20 applications that have been submitted, um, 13 of those for special use reviews on vacation rentals, four for limited impact special use reviews on vacation rentals, uh, two limited impact special use reviews for secondary dwelling short-term rentals, and one limited impact special use review waiver for a secondary dwelling short-term rental. Um, in addition to that, we've issued 41 licenses for primary dwelling short-term rentals, one license for a secondary dwelling short-term rental, and eight vacation rental licenses. Um, during the review, as I said, it's cut off uh, on September 15th for that first round we were able to look at 14 of the applications and kind of the criteria for determining at that time what applications we were gonna look at were those that have made it to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and of the 14 that we looked at, all of those had received uh, approval. Um, again, just to note, recent applications aren't included in this data, but we'll take a look. Um, I'm targeting sometime around the beginning of November to see what has changed since then. Um, because we just had to have a, a cutoff point for the review or else I'd be adding information over and over again. Um, Can I ask a question about this number? Yeah. Um, does that 50 licenses include those 20 applications or are those in addition to that? So it includes some of the applications. It's kind of compartmentalized a little bit differently because the primary dwelling short-term rental licenses wouldn't require a land use review. Um, the secondary dwelling short-term rental process or the secondary dwelling short-term rental license and the vacation rental licenses are they would align with some of those reviews, um, but not all of them have finished the process to receive uh, or have been issued a license. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and again, just to be incredibly clear, when I talk about trends from now on, I'm gonna be referencing these 14 applications that we took a look at. 
So to start off, we're kind of kind of revisit a little bit of something we discussed already regarding land use review processes. But um, what I've tried to do in this table is outli outline the type of rentals that we have available, the land use review process that we use for those rentals, the level of effort compared. It's a comparison between these different processes. Um, opportunities for public input, again, it's comparative among these processes, and then site-specific analysis. Um, so for a primary dwelling short-term rental, again, we see it's only a license. There's no land use review. It is, out of these processes, the lowest level of effort. Uh, the public opportunities for input, there are none. Um, and the site-specific analysis, is, is ex it's limited. Um, because it, it wouldn't necessarily be a site-specific analysis as we consider it in a land use review, but the licensing ordinance does require us to take a look at things like parking or uh, you know, the septic system on, on site. So for the secondary dwelling short-term rental uh, licenses, again, those are the ones that are rented for less than 60 days and are not the primary residence of the, the property owner. Um, those are those are uh, through the limited impact special use review waiver process. That is a low level of effort. The public uh, input opportunities are also low and the site specific analysis, it's required, but the director can determine that if the application meets, it doesn't, it's not in conflict with the criteria for the special use review or the limited impact special use review, then it can be waived and the director can make a determination. Um, the limited impact special use review process, I think you all are probably a little bit more familiar with that uh, process since those are some of the ones that come before the Board of County Commissioners. Um, that level of effort I would categorize as medium, the, the opportunities for public input also medium, and the site-specific analysis, it occurs in accordance with 4-601, which are those you know, special use review, limited impact special use review criteria. So for vacation rental, I won't go back through the limited impact special use review process, but we also have the special use review process. Um, that is the most level of effort. Uh, the opportunities for public input are also the most, um, and site-specific analysis for the, you know, the secondary dwelling short-term rentals and the vacation rentals, it's, it's required unless there is a waiver for the secondary dwelling short-term rental. Um, when I say the most public input opportunities, just as an example, the uh, special use review process, we have a referral and comment period where we refer to agencies and out to adjacent property owners. The public can comment in that way. Uh, the special use review applications are also reviewed by the Planning Commission, so there's an opportunity for public comment there. And then they are also reviewed and approved or denied by the Board of County Commissioners, so there's another opportunity for public comment there. So just as an example. So looking at the 14 applications that I had a chance to review, um, the average public response rate when we reach out to adjacent property owners and ask for written comments on the, the land use review, the average response rate is 10.4% and the median response rate is 5.2%. This is a pretty simple calculation. It's just taking the number of letters we sent and the number of responses we received and turning it into a fraction and getting a percentage. Um, Adjacent property owners, they may or may not respond um, for different reasons. Uh, the land use review application or code might sufficiently address their concerns and they don't feel a need to respond. Um, or you know they might not have a high level of interest in the particular application. I think it's pretty hard to determine why folks may or may not respond because also each property kind of has unique situations. Um, and so that could impact those response rates. Um, when we do receive public comments from the public, oftentimes what we're seeing these comments focused on, I've tried to categorize them there, uh, here, um, but they're generally concerns about impacts to neighbors, concerns which includes things like noise, trespassing, uh, off-road vehicle usage, traffic, shared access. Um, there are concerns about public safety and natural hazards, which typically is wildfire risk, flood risk, access for emergency vehicles, using fireworks, using firearms, things like that. Um, Sometimes we see concerns about reduced housing stock or concerns about or, or support for the application because it benefits the local economy and tourism. Um, and we also see some concerns from respondents about the impact to local wildlife uh, or natural resources. 
those two kind of um, buckets that I've outlined in red are things that we can't really influence through the special use review process. Um, and so, you know, it might be something that we, there might be a better tool for that, which is, you know, something we might need to take a look at. And so, one of the things, and just to forewarn you, we're about to take a look at an interesting table that I'm going to do my best to explain, but I've tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, in all of the applications that, the land use reviews do provide an opportunity um, to mitigate impacts or concerns that aren't specifically addressed by the land use code uh, or the licensing ordinance. And so in all of the applications that I reviewed, recommendations for approvals by the PC and by the Board of County Commissioners were aligned with the staff's recommendations. Um, there were modifications to the number of guests, the minimum night rental period, and total number of nights allowed for rentals per year. Um, generally, that happened during staff review uh, or before it even, as far as I can tell, before it even came to planning commission. Um, there were three applications that had the number of guests reduced to accommodate on-site wastewater treatment system capacity. Uh, one application was reduced because the number of guests needed to be limited due to on-site parking availability. And three applications were reduced. Um, the total number of nights a year allowed uh, were reduced. And one of that came about from the applicant's consultation with neighbors, and the other two were reduced due to concerns with neighborhood compatibility. Question on that. Those yeah. reductions, were those all during the staff process or those during the hearings? I don't think any came about during the hearing. I believe all of them were, they came about during the staff review process. And again, that's for those specific applications that I've had an opportunity to take a look at. Um, the, so this table kind of, Could yes. you go back to the, oh, you're not sharing your screen or maybe somebody else who's in charge. Go there, no, the previous slide. Yeah, thanks, just wanted to take another second to look at that. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm gonna use that opportunity to take a drink. You should have that opportunity anytime. Um, okay, I'm good, thanks. Great. So this table kind of explains what I, I just um, walked through. Um, I've changed the application designators a little bit just so that we're not putting all the applications as aggregated data um, and noted the rental type. Um, the max number of guests, the max number of nights that the rental was approved for, and the minimum stay, which is the minimum rental period. Typically, we see two days, three days. Um, so those that are in yellow, that, that's the one where the number of nights was reduced because the applicant had a consultation with their neighbors and decided to reduce the nights. You can see kind of that orangish, orangish pink color, salmon, I guess, is how I would say. Um, that is a reduction due to capacity limits of the on-site wastewater treatment system. And then that brown number down there is a reduction due to on-site uh, parking limitations. And so this is just a table of, of that data for each specific application that was reviewed. Similarly, on this one, we see that there was a reduction in uh, the um, number of guests allowed due to the on-site wastewater treatment system and a number, a reduction in the number of nights. In this instance, these two applications were reduced for uh, compatibility with the, the neighborhood, among other things. Um, and so there are just some things that I, I wanna note for you having looked at this data. Um, vacation rentals, again, are those that can be limited or that those can be rented for more than 60 nights per year. Uh, all of the vacation rental applications that were reviewed as part of this particular review, um, they had the minimum number of nights that we saw in, was 120 nights, um, even though the, the kind of start is at 60. Um, oftentimes, like I said, we, if we do see a reduction in the number of guests, it's due to capacity limitations associated with the on-site wastewater treatment system which isn't necessarily something that has to come about as part of the land use review process because the licensing already impacts that. Um, and then, you know, as I said, uh, we saw some reductions in nights um, due to consultation with neighbors or due to concerns about compatibility with the neighborhood. And I think what I'm trying to convey is that 
Um, the land use review process that we have does provide us with opportunities to influence uh, certain things based off of you know the criteria and metrics or the criteria that exist in the land use code. Um, but some of those things that we often see end up in the conditions of, of approval, which we'll take a look at next, uh, are already handled by the land use code or by the licensing ordinance. Um, and so, Ethan, before you move on, yes. Um, other than the number of days, um, maximum number of days that were reduced because of dialogue with neighbors. Uh, generally was w what you recommended and what the county commissioners and planning commissioner recommended um, consistent with just what they came in and requested were there instances I think we talked about this earlier were there instances in which they requested a number of days and you asked them to reduce that so generally um, there are other staff in the office who do these uh, uh, reviews um, but in looking at their the kind of applications that came in. I think trying to figure out where we came up with the number of nights is something that I'm gonna have to dig into a little bit deeper. Um, right now, I don't have a good answer. I have some suspicions, but I'm not totally confident that they're accurate. Um, but, you know, sometimes we did see um, folks come in with an application for um, 180 nights, and that's what they got. Uh, sometimes when we saw people impose, so for instance, vacation rentals, the land use code doesn't require a minimum rental period. But what we often see condition and what we often see happen is a two night minimum rental period. And sometimes that's by request of the applicant who already is determined that they're going to rent for a two night minimum or they're gonna rent for a three night minimum. And sometimes it might be a recommendation from staff to say, look, if you wanna try and reduce you know, turnover impacts, then maybe a longer rental period is something that you should consider. So I'm trying to track that down. I can't promise that I'm gonna to get to it in the final report, but it's something that I'm taking, trying to take a look at. Um, I, I guess I wanted to um, maybe paraphrase what you were saying before. So with um, you know, the on-site wastewater treatment system and the parking situation, that limits the number of guests, right? There, there's no subjectivity to that, those were just decrease because that's what was required by code. Is that correct? So, sorry, I was trying to think back through the, the applications. Generally, when we do see that, recre that, that decrease, at least the ones that I looked at, it is due to, um, you know, maybe an applicant says, I want to rent to six guests. And then we look at the on-site wastewater treatment system and we say that public health says this is sized for four people. Um, that's the number you can rent to. Um, or if you know the number of sleeping rooms in the residence aligns with the size of the wastewater treatment system, then if you ask for six, you might get six. Um, in some instances, I think maybe one, um, and I'd have to go back and look, but I think in maybe one instance, the septic system may have been sized for four people, but the applicant was only interested in renting to a smaller number. Um, does that answer your question? Well, with that smaller number one, that wasn't, that, was that reflected in the table as a different color? Yeah, there, well, there, no, um, I don't think so. Um, there was one reflected where it was smaller, but that was due to limitations due to on-site uh, parking, okay. the availability of on-site parking. So in that instance, I think the property was sized for, the septic system could have supported four people but the parking could only support two, so we ended up in a situation where the maximum occupancy is two people. Okay, and then in your table, there are a few that were 365 nights, no minimum. Are mm -hmm. there any commonalities in those properties? Aside from they're all vacation rentals, um, generally, um, I'd have to go take a deeper look at that, and that's something, when we get to the discussion, I think one of my questions is, um, I've got some recommended questions that we can consider, but we can go in whatever direction you'd like. Um, I, uh, I'm interested in hearing things like that. You know, are there any particular issues that we've discussed today or anything that's can't come up that you want us to dig into a little bit deeper? Um, so uh, we've only got a little bit left, and it's just, a, it's just a kind of a comparison of the common approval conditions that we've seen for these applications. Um, I'm not certain. There we are. Um, and so this isn't an all-encompassing list, but it's pretty good. Um, 
it most we see some of these uh, we see these conditions on most applications that have been approved. Um, and so what I've what I've done here uh, is, for instance, the completion of a development agreement prior to issuance of a license or a permit. That's required by the code because it's it's part of the land uh, it's part of the land use review process that these are approved under. Um, the applicant has to maintain a uh, valid Boulder County rental license, also required by the code. So, in these ones where you see kind of a green text underneath, it's a requirement somewhere already, but we condition it anyway. The property might may not be marketed for weddings, receptions, or similar public private events. That is a requirement in the code. Um, the rental is approved for X number of nights per year. Um, you know, as an example, again, no more than 180 nights per year. Uh, for secondary dwelling short-term rentals, the code limits that number already to under 60, but the land use review process um, is where we see, you know, sometimes that number be decreased um, or just approved based off of what has been presented to the board. And then, uh, again, for the minimum rental uh, period, we see X number of nights. Generally, it's a two-night minimum. The code requires that for a secondary dwelling short-term rental. Um, but again, land use reviews that are you know, presented to you all uh, can result in a minimum night stay for vacation rentals. Again, max occupancy, the licensing ordinance kind of addresses that and the fact that there are on-site parking requirements and an on-site wastewater treatment system capacity requirement. Um, on-site parking, licensing again. Wildfire partner certificate, this is a common one that we see. Um, this is required uh, in kind of different increments depending on the rental uh, in the licensing ordinance. And then life safety inspection, also required by licensing. Access improvement maintenance agreements, we, also, we often see these as a result of the land use review process, but it, it may be that there's another way to include those. Uh, that's something that I'm taking a look at. Uh, and then there are other conditions that we see based off of you know, unique characteristics of a property. Maybe they need an emergency turnaround, something like that. What I think the key takeaway here is, is that when we do see so far the land use review process exercised to review these applications, generally when we do see changes requested, they're either an adjustment to the total number of nights that the vacation rental can be rented, or they're um, an adjustment to the minimum number of nights, the minimum rental period, um, or there's, it, it allows you to take that site-specific look at compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood and the area. And so um, with that, that's kind of the, the trends that have been able to identify and the ones we've looked at so far. Um, I do have just some questions uh, that we all can consider. I, like I said, I'm happy to try and go in whatever direction you like. Again, we're kind of early in the process. I don't have any solutions right now. I probably don't have all the answers, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and so, you know, are the existing regulations helping us accomplish our policy goals? Um, are they meeting your intent as policymakers? Uh, are there any specific areas you'd like us to take a look at? Um, feel free to take a look at the questions on your screen. There's another slide that I can show you as well, but happy to start wherever you all would like. Um, I'll jump in. Um, thanks for that presentation. It's it's interesting review of what we have done over the last year. Uh, I was one of the commissioners that voted for this in the first place, um, and it was interesting when we sent it off. The one thing I was hoping to get out of this presentation is how many short-term rentals there are, our enforcement efforts, and why there aren't more people going through the process. So I have um, some basic data about the enforcement process that I can provide you with. Um, and we can kind of walk through a timeline of how that occurred, and I'm going to do my best to try and remember it. But, you know, the, the licensing ordinance went into effect of February 2021. I think we contracted with a third-party vendor, Hermari, in uh, June of 2021. And then in October of 2021, staff, some staff had been trained on how to use Hermari, which is that third-party vendor that helps us monitor uh, short-term rental regulations or short-term rentals in the county. And then we received an initial tranche of potential violations uh, from Hermari. So we went through, the staff at the time went through that to try and determine what, um, which violations were actual violations and what violations might not be violations. Um, as we started to kind of move forward with that, the Marshall Fire happened, which resources, I mean, it was all hands on deck and kind of responding to that. And so come around to March 2022, 
Uh, we've sent some compliance letters um, to uh, the violations that we confirmed were actual violations. And so my understanding is that there were uh, 162 properties that we determined were in violation based off of the information that Hermari provided us. Um, 14 out of the total that they sent us was not, that they weren't, um, they weren't in violation. We made that determination. Uh, 34 properties came into compliance. That's either through not renting anymore or per pursuing a license. Um, 28 are going through the applicable planning or licensing process, and 86 of those require follow-up. And so that's kind of some general numbers about the enforcement. I will say that during that kind of October to December period, you know, we were in the process of confirming that those violations were actually violations and also setting up some, some kind of internal processes to help us manage and track what we were actually doing. Um, and so as part of the review um, in that kind of enforcement bucket that we talked about, I'm planning, planning to take a look at with um, my colleagues who work on the enforcement team, um, where we started, who's come into compliance, what, who hasn't come into compliance, and what do we need to do now? Um, so right now, that's the best enforcement data I have. Um, I hope okay. that's helpful. So how many short-term rentals is, are estimated to be in Boulder County, an unincorporated area? When we were adopting this, I thought it was something like 800. When you, when, so I'm not certain about the total number right now. Um, when you adopted the regulations in 2019 or 20, um, in 20, 19. Yeah, 2019. Um, it was the presentation that I saw, and I had to go back and look at some of this to build some institutional knowledge. Um, but the presentation that I saw was something like 700. Right, I remember that number. Um, and so, you know, that that takes a little bit of, of digging, um, right? Because I think it's important to see where we were at, where we're at now, uh, where we need to go as part of the enforcement uh, piece of the review. Um, but trying to, you know, we, we can try and categorize that data to determine, well, who didn't pursue a license, who um, did pursue a license, who's in the process of a license, who just stopped renting, right? Um, and then, you know, we see what we get. So if, if the original estimate was 700, mm -hmm. and Hamari found that 162 were out of compliance, was the original estimate way off, or is there some very, were they 30 day rentals, so therefore they were under 30 days and not really a short term rental as we're thinking of it? What, what would explain that? Uh, that's something I'd have to look at in detail. Um, it was a different staffer working on the issue, and I'd have to go back and see where they came up with that information um, and then see what. Uh oh. <laughs> I forgot yeah. I have that. It's a lifeline. Yeah. Life Good afternoon, Dale Case, uh, Community Planning and Permitting. And to follow up a little bit on that, I think Ethan's right, we have a lot of work to do kind of to unravel these numbers and the differences that we're, we've seen. Um, the initial estimates were done by firms like Kamari that gave us data, but it was just a very broad sweep of listings at that time. And I think it was, it, what is showing from what Hamari data has shown us initially is that that, that number was really high. Um, we think that the regulations also made people come into compliance and stop listing their properties through some of these sites that we comb. So that, that just the adoption of the regulations had people stop doing that. Um, we think even the letters that we sent, when we go back and look at some of those, we've seen those listings have been pulled. And so I think the regulations are having their intended effect, but we still have a lot of work, I think, to do to verify where we stand and what that situation is as we move forward. And as, as Ethan said, with staffing changes and the fire, we've been uh, a little bit slow to do it. And Hamari has been going through the same thing. So um, we lost a little bit of support from them for a little bit because they were short staffed. So we're getting back on track on that. Okay, thanks. So just, just to know that the 162 not in compliance, and what were the other numbers? Um, four, 14 uh, not in violation. Uh, 34 achieved compliance, which means they either obtained a license or they ceased their rental. Uh, 28 are actively going through a process to come into compliance. And 86 require follow-up compliance letters. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I have for now.
uh, uh, Ethan, is when you say they're out of compliance or they're in a violation, uh, it seems to me those are two different things. One would be to say, did they have a license? Uh, the other would, to me, the violation on enforcement that we promised when we were adopting this really was when people were committing violations uh, during the rental itself. So it wasn't a question about whether you had a license or not, but whether if the guests were doing things that were trespassing, they were having party nights, or they were something uh, that would impact the neighborhood uh, or the neighbors or would create dangers. Uh, how quickly did we respond to those kinds of violations uh, by the renters rather than just the violation of not having a license? So I think, I, I don't know the numbers uh, for that. I think that's something that we can take a look at during the review. Uh, I think you're right. There are different types of, I mean, there are violations, right? One of the violations might be that you're not in compliance with the regulations or the licensing ordinance. And the other type might be that somebody is complaining that you're not using your uh, vacation rental as approved. And so if that's something you'd like us to explore further, we can take that for action and try and include it in the, in the report. I, I do, my own sense is that when we approved this, one of the criteria for the approval is uh, compatibility with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That our, uh, the reason we were willing to do that was the emphasis that the county would, in the new system where you had to have licenses for short-term rentals, uh, we were not not only going to have a license, but we were going to have uh, staff and quick response uh, when people were not complying uh, with the regulations and the conditions that are uh, stated in the in the license requirements themselves or in the conditions of approval. So. I, I think that's a really critical part. Mm -hmm. Getting people to have the licenses is an important part. But again, I think our reassurance in uh, approving a lot of the ones that have gone to review by the Planning Commission has been uh, a statement of faith that we were going to follow through and actually uh, have someone and have quick responses when. Uh, people were actually doing things as short-term renters that were uh, not compatible with the license requirements. Yeah, and, and um, I understand that, and I think I'll need to think about how we capture that as far as, um, you know, the enforcement section of the review. But I also think that it's, it's, it's important to note that, um, you know, and for those of you, um, Dale or Kim, if I get off base here, just please let me know. Um, but I think that, you know, typically we receive complaints and then we try and enforce. And with Hermari uh, helping us, you know, monitor the rentals that aren't supposed to be rentals, we, we have kind of a more proactive way of doing things, which is not, you know, it's, it's kind of a different way. And it requires some different, it requires more staff time. It requires kind of a different setup. And it, it requires time to set up, which is why... I kind of tried to highlight that uh, period between October and January where we, we have some internal things, we had some internal things that we needed to do um, so that we could actually track what we were doing. And so there, you know, the wheels have been turning um, and that's laid kind of a groundwork. And I think the, the review kind of provides us with an opportunity to address some of the things that you've asked about and say, okay, well, this is where we're at, um, but where do we want to go, which is, you know, bring folks into compliance and ensure that these are, you know, used in a safe manner. Um, and how do we get there uh, at this point? And so um, I hope that helps answer the question. So this is Commissioner Hsu. Uh, sort of along those lines, um, and maybe to answer some of the questions that you had in your presentation. Yeah, and I'm happy to go back to any. Okay. Yeah, so um, the question about whether we have sufficient guidance to make decisions regarding these applications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the one criteria that we try to focus on is compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. But I, 
I feel like we have very little guidance on that, or ver I, I don't know how to judge this. Um, you know, I've been on, I think we've approved every single vacation rental. I couldn't tell you whether 365 nights a year is compatible with certain properties versus 180, 120 nights. Um, it's very hard to understand, and you know, you can weigh how much community input comes in, but that also doesn't seem like the right way to do it, just based on a, a poll, poll of neighbors. Um, so I would like to have something to understand, and um, you know, it would be nice to know the violations from things that we approved because people are concerned about, you know, rowdy guests, uh, wildfire concerns. So, like, did we approve something that's not really compatible with the neighborhood, and then we can kind of come up with some way to decide what is compatible and what's not as far as the number of nights. Um, but my personal view is, I, I mean, when these vacation rentals come up on Planning Commission, it's just not my favorite thing to do. We, we end up approving them, you know, we weren't, you know I'm, not, I'm speaking for the past, not the future, but we end up approving them. We have some discussion and, you know, I just don't know what we're deciding. Right, um, and so I'm seeing I'm seeing some head nods. Um, I, I, that I'm yes, to jump in. If I could sure jump in on that. I mean, I think that's because the, the regulations are written really well, or at least they're expansive. So there's, you know, all the conditions of approval end up being well. This is what the regulation is, and now here it is as a condition of approval. I think that's actually a, a good thing. Um, we have a strong policy. It may have some tweaks that, that need to be made, but. I do feel like, like David does, it's kind of like, well, here it is, it checks all the boxes. We've had some public comment. Um, you're on the record to follow the rules, and that's a good thing, but it is sort of like, well, what exactly are we reviewing here, it, it seems like. And, and just to add, I guess I should clarify, like I think you were getting at that staff is doing a lot of this beforehand, and yeah. I think staff is doing a good job, so we yeah. don't have to come in and say like, oh, why are these numbers off? But then it, it does bring into question what we're actually Really review. It seems like we're double checking staff, which is, I guess, what we do anyway. But um, it's a little bit hard to understand. Um, I mean, it does seem like a lot of extra review for something that staff has shown. Um, at least with, you know, based on planning commission, we seem to be in agreement with um, what what staff has decided. Thanks, Ethan, for the presentation yeah. and for being here to answer questions. I'm, I'm curious because we're talking a little bit about one of those pieces of uh, what is was in the memo, more effective enforcement of short-term dwelling rental regulations as kind of the background of what this, uh, what this amendment was supposed to do. The one we haven't talked about yet, and I'd be really interested in hearing everybody's thoughts around, one of those goals was in regards to, in, per this memo, maintaining housing stock and housing affordability. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that this process so far, how, how we've been working with the amendment, if, if, if you all want to staff feel like we've met that goal, this is working, and also what folks' experience has been so far, because that was one of the reasons why the amendments were written. So I have a whole list of questions, but I want to make sure that other folks have an opportunity to speak as well. Yeah, I'll, I, I mean, I can take a stab at it um, just real quickly. I think, you know, that is one of the complex things that you all have to deal with is the comprehensive plan has competing goals, right? When the amendments were passed in 2019, the, the two kind of key goals referenced by the, the presentation were the housing element that says we want to try and preserve housing stock for those people who live and work in Boulder County. But there's also that understanding that these provide an economic benefit and they, they support tourism. And so those goals, you know, they're in a little bit of competition. And so I think that's kind of where we're trying to determine some guidance of, it's, it's kind of hard to determine right now, what is the appropriate number of, of vacation rentals, right? Um, and when do we reach that number? I personally think that it's a little, we're still kind of early on in the process. And so we probably haven't seen that and it could be site specific again, location specific. Um, but I think that's kind of the, you know, one of the things that we're trying to address in, in taking a look um, at the regulations so far is, uh, do, do you all feel like we're we're getting there? Is this helping? Um, and you know, uh, it still, I haven't started the pro process of drafting some ele elements of the report, but I think you know, like I said, we're going to take a look at other jurisdictions, some of the things that it may it may have changed since then, and and try to give you all you know 
just some broad information to consider as we, we think about maybe what comes next, if anything comes next. Um, but yeah, that those there are competing elements in the, the comprehensive plan. I mean, the plan notes it itself, right? It says it's not formulaic. It just, there are gonna be, there's gonna be tension. A long, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just maybe we'll go ahead, just go down the, the, the dias here. I, I wrote down four questions. Two of them really pick up on things that have already been mentioned. Um, and, and I think, you know, I've, I've had some unease, I think, about the way that we limit the number of nights mm -hmm. um, because it does, um, it is generally when I ask, well, what was the basis for the number of nights? Um, it's uh, the response is generally that's what the applicant requested mm -hmm. and I think you know to David's question is that a reflection of compatibility um, what is it what are we trying to achieve with that limitation and I think we need to do some more thinking about that mm -hmm. if we've decided that this particular home in this particular location is appropriate as an STR um, I mean I have a hard time making the leap to the next thing that there should be a limit. I'm not saying I couldn't get there. I mean, because I think it definitely has impacts, the turnover and new people, and mm -hmm. they can't find the driveway and they drive into the ditch and all of that kind of thing. Um, so I think we do need to think a little bit more about how we approach that, that maximum number of nights. But I think, I think there's a lot of potential to uh, cut back on the number of discretionary hearings that we have because so often um, we adopt staff recommendations. You've worked so hard. This is a reflection of the quality of the regulation and the work of the uh, staff with the applicants. Um, you work hard to bring us a case that we can approve. We approve it and it's a lot of delay for the applicant. It's staff time. And, and so I'd like us to see if there are ways that we can reduce the number of hearings. The, the two um, other things that I guess I have been um, cogitating on, one has to do with that issue of maintaining housing. And I, the only two that I can th readily think of where I had concerns, one very recently we denied because it was a property that was, that was very appropriate as long-term housing, rental housing, um, and um, there were compatibility issues. The other was one on the Plains, um, I think it was North 63rd Street, it was at a T intersection, I always forget the name of the road, whether it's St. Vrain or, um, but, I, but um, a five acre lot. It met the criteria, mm -hmm. but not in an area of the county that has a lot of, has any, you know, tourist lodging. Right. And yet we really didn't have any basis to deny it. And I would like us to cons to look at whether, instead of doing it based on zoning district, <coughs> property size, or maybe not substituting out, but whether we can add some kind of a geographic overlay to this consideration so that we're limiting um, vacation rentals, STRs to areas, you know, that wouldn't be suitable for, or a kind of housing stock, um, something. I'm not sure what that would be mm. to address that issue. And, uh, and then the fourth, and then, you know, you respond or we'll get other response from Planning Commission. Um, the fourth is, is uh, whether we might be requiring too much parking. Um, when we require a parking space per bedroom, um, there's an assumption that each bedroom is going to be occupied by an individual, you know, a, a separate, you know, autonomous person. It's going to be rented together. Um, and I think sometimes that, A, can require too much impact on the land. Um, there have been a couple of instances in which it's limited the number where otherwise there are more appropriate number of bedrooms and um, the wastewater treatment um, facility could accommodate it. And I think there's another way to do that, which would just be to require 
um, the, the owner to indicate how many parking spaces there are and limit the number of cars accordingly and just indicate there will be no um, off-site on-road parking and um, because you know we we see we see a lot of cars you know potential for cars in various spaces and and land being cleared to accommodate those so those were the four things that have come up for me yeah and I, I'll just say that you know like I said I, it, it, we're still kind of early in the process I don't really have I don't want to presuppose any outcomes I'm trying to see where the the review takes me um, and I just, you know, as far as your reference to the planners who make you all's lives a little bit easier, um, I, those I've read their app, the the work that they've done in their staff recs. They do a great job, so I just want to make sure they get the the credit they deserve. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm long range planner by trade, and so I don't generally do these types of applications, but it's it's all their work. Um, I that's definitely something that we can we can take a look at, try to take a look at, um, and then I'm happy to hear from anyone else. So, so I have more questions, but I yeah. only asked my one so that others could go. But before yeah. this is over, I want to ask the other two. Sure. So you had some. I had two very brief responses to, to Claire's questions. Um, one was around the um, the housing availability element, and I, I think just how I understand the narrative of how this came about and how we've thought about it was primarily to bring into compliance activity that was already happening and enforce the regulation of that at some level. And to me, at least, this is not the... This has not been an effective instrument to promote any kind of housing availability or affordability, but rather to reflect what was already happening and try to find licensing and improve conditions that were being seen as negative conditions of that activity. So people were not being asked to control parking or asked to limit the number of nights or asked to limit how many people were in the, uh, in the facility. I think it's been effective at that, uh, but there are different instruments for uh, pursuing better affordability of housing than this. Mm -hmm. um, on the geogra geographic overlay, I think that's an interesting idea. One way we do that is through zoning limitations, and this is limited by zoning districts, so there is already some degree of limitation. Maybe there are districts like a state residential where it's less appropriate than forestry. Yeah, you well, can't you can't have a vacation rental in the state residential zone. You can have a uh, short. You can term have a you secondary. can have a secondary dwelling short term rental yeah. because I think at the time it was assessed that that less than sixty days a year would have kind of a, a, a less of an impact. Yeah, so and that a primary dwelling short term rental would. If you're hopefully living in the house and renting out the room, I mean that's it's a pretty good economic outcome. I think I think that's to my point. We are yeah. limiting it based on zoning districts. Yeah. There is a geographic component to what is appropriate and allowed to be, to even be submitted. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah, I think my comments as someone kind of new to this. Uh, when I first started getting planning packets with a bunch of short-term rentals, I, I was kind of curious to see what value we'd be adding to the process. And the thing that actually surprised me the most is how much of it does get caught and, and reasonable concerns already addressed through the process. And so then by the time it gets to us, it's a pretty reasonable application and, and mm -hmm. process you kind of see from the data. And so I think my only comment is that I've, I was even skeptical about how much things would change from the applicant's perspective of what they wanted as a short-term rental and then having gone through the process. It was interesting to see, especially for someone who bought a you know a property uh, along Peak to Peak Highway from out of state and wasn't necessarily aware of the concerns that might come along with that property. But then having gone through the process, it was interesting to see how much that already worked with staff and worked with their neighbors uh, and worked with wildfire partners to address some of those concerns as well. So. I saw, just from my experience so far, that there's a lot of value in the process, but I kind of, I agree with the sentiment that by the time it gets to us, that process has turned it into a reasonable proposal. Um, and so there's maybe not a lot for planning commission to then do other than, yeah, the process worked and you've addressed a lot of the stuff that came out of the process. Yeah, like, like I said, um, and again, it's a snapshot in time, right? It's not perfect data, but it's data. Um, the licensing ordinance already requires you to work with wildfire partners. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a condition of the review, but we, we do condition it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff, at least so far from what I've seen, does get addressed during that process. And so, you know, that kind of leads to the, the question that I was asking is, is this level of review appropriate, you know? Um, is there another mechanism? I'm hearing, uh, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I'm hearing some sentiment that there might be another mechanism that we, we can take a look at, and that's something that we need to explore. 
Um, so I'm happy to do that as well. Ethan, thank you for your presentation and for the, all of that information. Um, in regards to the portion of the amendment that we were discussing um, that's concerned with housing stock and the balancing the needs within the comprehensive plan, mm -hmm. um, do we know by classification, primary dwelling, secondary dwelling, and vacation rental, do we have a reasonably accurate count for how many active licenses we have within Boulder County? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, so we have 41 licenses for uh, primary dwelling short-term rentals. Again, those are the ones that don't require a land use review process. Uh, one license for a secondary dwelling short-term rental, that's the one that's less than 60 days. Um, and then eight vacation rental licenses. And this is with just within the time frame that we've been talking about, right? Or is this total? Uh, yes, this is this is from the implementation uh, of the uh, land use code text and the ordinance up until September of 2022 of this year. I would note that you know just to kind of provide some uh, additional information that generally a special use review process we anticipate will take about six months, mm -hmm. um, and the. Uh, I have to go back and look at the data. Um, it's something I'm planning on including, but just kind of like a, a, a cursory glance, it seems like most of the special use reviews that we've done have fallen um, within the five to six month time frame. Um, so that's about what we would expect for these types of applications. And so the 41 primary dwelling short-term rentals, that's that have undergone this process that we're talking about but do we know total? Are, the, are there more than 41 total in the county? Um, so the primary dwelling short-term rentals wouldn't go through a land use review process. The way that it would work for them, um, and I, my colleague Kathy from licensing is, is here, and so if I mess this up or if you'd like to jump in, uh, please feel free, but um, yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm Kathy Gissel. I am the permit and, operate, permit and licensing operations manager for CPMP. Um, so yes, the primary rental. Hold the mic a little closer, please. The microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, can can you hear me better? Okay. Better. Yeah. Um, better. So yes, we currently have 41 primary licenses that are issued. We currently have 50 other of them that are have applied for a primary license but have not turned in all of the appropriate paperwork, so they have not become licensed yet. So we have close to almost 100 of them licensed, but they're kind of in that in between stage. And then for secondary dwelling, short-term rentals? Secondary, we have two applications in that are not complete yet as well, um, in addition to what has already been issued. Okay, and, and then the vacation rentals? We have one application in for a vacation rental from what has been approved. Okay, thank you. I'll go through my list real quick then. Um, sure. Getting to the... Uh, maintaining housing issue. Um, in the comp plan, we not only wrestle with the uh, um, housing, uh, with uh, providing affordable housing and housing stock and tourism, we also wrestle with providing uh, or trying to get more intensive activities, city type activities into cities. Mm -hmm. uh, and short-term rentals are commercial uses. They're mm -hmm. not taxed as such. They have a huge tax advantage, but they are providing the same services if you go to a hotel somewhere. Uh, and so that's another consideration, I think, as far as uh, providing uh, housing stock. We're taking basically people's housing, their residential housing, and turning it into uh, not hotels, but something that competes directly with hotels. So I think it does have an effect how much, I mean, you can argue about housing issues all day long and what's effective and what's not. But uh, I do think it does have some um, validity and it came up in the hearings when we first adopted these from the public uh, about this concern. I remember from Allen's Park and other parts of the mountains hearing that. Um, the second thing um, is, um, we, we haven't talked a whole lot about the neighbor's voice here, the public's voice. Mm -hmm. And I think these hearings give opportunity for people to voice their concerns. And this is Boulder County. People want that. They expect that. And we, we should be considering that in this um, if we're thinking about reducing the number of hearings. Uh, and I, it, I think of this last hearing we had where we denied the, the, the uh, 
the permit and um, the public provided very valuable information about compatibility, that criteria. And that to me is the crux of this thing, um, is how you determine compatibility and our, our criteria is pretty broad and could be taken a number of ways. And in that case, there were a house directly across from a house in a subdivision where you couldn't have a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. And it's an artifact where we decided this is not compatible in the subdivision, but right across the street it can be just because of an artificial line. So I think that compatibility needs to be worked on. Um, and it rolls into the, the number of minimum nights, as you mentioned, and the nights allowed. And the other thing that I've really struggled with in these is how many nights, because you may not want to deny it, but you may want to decrease the intensity, but there's no rule that says you can do that. It's all up to the applicant to reduce it voluntarily, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, so that should be part of that compatibility test and that the intensity of the use of a commercial operation in the middle of a neighborhood. And um, before we had this structure, we would get these regular hearings where people would come in and they'd talk about how their neighborhood was being changed into a place where people were doing short-term rentals all the time and the character of the neighborhood was changing. And it would be every hearing, the person applying for it and about 20 neighbors, 10 neighbors, dozen neighbors, mad about it because right. of compatibility. So I think our compatibility part needs to be refined in this, whether we hear it or not. And I don't know quite how to do that, but the artificial distinction of zones and where their boundaries are is a, is a problem in my mind. So those are my thoughts. Yeah. And, and again, like I said, I'm not trying to presuppose any outcomes um, or say that one way is better than another way. I'm just trying to gather some information from you all as, as people who you know use the processes to make decisions. And I think if, if we can show this slide that I've got up real quick, um, kind of to get to that point, um, and I will, there are different opportunities, as I mentioned, for public engagement throughout the process, depending on what the process is. So the top kind of flow chart that uh, I've done my best with is, is what it would look like in a limited impact, impact special use review, right? Those two kind of darker green than the lighter green um, are the opportunities where you would see public comment. And we still receive public comment throughout the staff review. Um, in the, um, so that second part is actually, it's misnamed. It should be the special use review process. Um, that one is uh, agency referral and response, the public hearing with PC and public hearing with BOCC. So there are those, that's, that there's an extra opportunity kind of for that public engagement. And so, yes, we may have done a, a great job at drafting the regulations. We end up with applications where we, we're, you know, we can focus on neighborhood compatibility or the minimum number of nights or the maximum number of nights per year. But I think that there is kind of that weighing and balancing that has to take place on um, and that's, you know, again, I appreciate your perspective because that's what I'm trying to get is that giving the public an opportunity to participate might be weighted higher than something else, right? So that's what I'm trying to get an understanding of. So, Abner, I, I would suggest as part of the review, it would be helpful to have just a map of where mm -hmm. the existing different categories of approvals have been made, been made. Uh, I do think, again, in some cases, both pro and cons, the area around Allen's Park uh, has been uh, lots of complaints about having too much regulation or any regulation at all because it was historically a area with lots of vacation and short and long-term rentals. Uh, but it would be useful, I think, for us in the Planning Commission and for the county commissioners to know actually where these things are, our approvals are going. Uh, and what we, it's not clear to me what we learn from that or what the implications are, but it's very hard to, for me at least, to think about a county as diverse as Boulder County. Uh, not taking into consideration something beyond just the basic zoning categories. 
Right, and I'm happy to work to try and produce a map like that. Um, it's just a matter of, one, trying to figure out ArcGIS myself yeah. or just relying on our very good ArcGIS folks. But yeah, I'm happy to include something like that. I had one request for data next time this comes up that would be interesting. Sure. Which was um, one of the concerns I think that came up in public was around people seeing this new opportunity and then buying a house for the express purpose of renting it out as a vacation rental. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know at an aggregate level the applications that have come in, are those people who've owned that same property for a long time, or is there evidence of people actually making acquisitions for that express purpose? Yeah, so there's, I, I can try and take a look at that. I, I'm pretty sure that the licensing ordinance limits um, the number of vacation rental licenses that any single one person or entity can have. And so we've tried to prevent that sort of kind of, you know, um, vacation rentals is like, you know, a large, corporation coming in. Sure, and even one person could be doing that with one house, right? Right, and, yeah. and so, you know, if you have one vacation rental license for property A, you're not going to be able, under the existing regulations and licensing ordinance, to get a, a vacation rental license for property B. Um, I mean, it is interesting to, to think about, you know, because we, the pandemic kind of changed the way things were going. I think broadly I've seen some information out there that suggests that, you know, a, those large banks or whoever started investing in properties as uh, kind of, you know, for vacation rentals. But whether or not that's the case here or if it's just kind of a broader thing that we've seen, um, it's something I can try and take a look at. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But I think as far as, you know, somebody having five vacation rentals, we do try and restrict that through the licensing and the land use code. Yeah, just to be clear, not about the large, I guess, large entities buying multiple Yeah, even one single. But even one person would be yeah. evidence of somebody seeing that as an opportunity to then do that, and that is a negative impact on housing availability. Yeah. In that case. Uh, I've got a couple comments. Uh, to, to the question of housing affordability, um, I do feel like from a, from a code standpoint, I feel like we've taken a good cut at that of uh, allowing the primary uh, dwellings to, to be unrestricted and then restricting other pieces. I think that strikes a really good balance between uh, the economic benefits of short-term rentals for, for primary dwellers, and et cetera. Um, as far as the, the question of, uh, you know, compatibility, I, I, I do think that we can start to get into challenges of trying to solve every little problem. I mean, there are gonna be some some consequences that we don't necessarily like, um, but finding that balance of uh, onerous regulations, you know, increased staff time, all of that kind of stuff, I think uh, it's important to try and balance those things. One, one quick, quick question that I have, I don't know if anybody knows this off the top of their head, but. Uh, how many houses are there in unincorporated Boulder County? So, I don't have the exact number, but if I recall, I'm going to try and recall back to the presentation that I saw in 2019. I think the number of homes in Boulder County is somewhere between 30 and 35,000. Unincorporated Boulder County. Yeah. Unincorporated. I, I think that's a little high tail case with community planning and permitting. I think um, when you look at single family homes and not condominiums and apartments that are in gun barrel, we're probably right around 20,000. Okay. Cool, thank you. And unincorporated. So. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's that's kind of one of the questions. Um, I, again, I think we've done a, 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 taken a pretty good stab at trying to make it balanced between, you know, in, in terms of not having short-term rentals take over uh, a bunch of housing. But um, I, I don't know how we, how we actually evaluate that other than say, well, we think we've got a pretty good, uh, pretty good code to help that. Um, the other kind of big question that I have is another topic is: Can you just talk a little bit about how, how Hamari works? Um, I just, I mean, it seems like they're they're looking at common websites. I'm assuming Airbnb and like VRBO and stuff like that. Are they actually looking at um, like the max number of renters that are allowed? Um, are they looking? I assume that they can't look at number of nights rented, because I assume that's not public data. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious as like what level of information you're getting from them um, to help to help with, you know, enforcement. Sure, yeah, so Kathy Gissel, Community Planning and Permitting again. Um, so Hamari looks at all of the rental 
platforms. They scrub data from that. Um, so they they snap take pictures of the pictures that people are posting on there. They show the nights that are available, the nights that are blocked off. They do show um, minimum nights that they're renting, maximum number of nights they're renting. Um, a requirement that we have in our, our ordinance is that they have to, anybody who obtains a license with us has to enter their license into their posting. Um, so they're looking for that information on the web pages as well. Um, so any of the, any properties that are in unincorporated Boulder County that they're finding that don't have that information or are renting for too many, too many nights or too many people, because um, we do let them know. We also send to them once a month our list of licensed um, properties, and we let them know how many nights are approved, how many people are approved. So they're scrubbing the data based on what we are giving them versus what people are renting to, and then they're sending that information back to us for us to review. Sure. I had a couple additional questions, if I may. Um, so just in, in a random order and as I take notes, I, I do think we need to talk about in this process if if the housing stock or housing affordability or either one of those, if, if that's not something that we agree that we can accomplish with this particular ordinance, then, then maybe then we need to change what the focus of it is. And I, I'm not saying yes or no, but I just feel like we're kind of bouncing around it and not addressing it. And so we, if that is one of the, it was originally one of the goals. And so how do we determine that? So and you don't have to respond to that, but that j just for the notes and the conversation as we continue this process. The other one um, that would be helpful in the data that you bring back in the next conversations would also be, I heard you talk about the time frame of the processes is expected five to six months. And so mm -hmm. just curious on the, the files that we don't see um, for primary dwelling, if what those time frames are too, just so we have a good idea of what everybody's experiencing, mm -hmm. because the perception for the public is it's all the same process, right? They're just in a different line on it. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, it's confusing to them to have the planning process and the licensing process, so that is something that I do end up explaining a lot to people. Um, but the primary licenses, the time frame for those are about six to eight weeks. So, okay. and that's, that's all that they go through on that. So the the secondary and the vacation rentals go through the planning process first, and then the six to eight weeks for the licensing as well. Okay, and that that's helpful from the standpoint of if somebody, you know, a resident, property owners experience a six to eight week process, and somebody else is working with a six month process, I would guess collectively our goal is to reduce that process time. And so, that how do we do that, um, and what could we implement in an amendment? Should we decide to do that? to reduce that, whether it creates another opportunity for an administrative review of another one of these processes, I'm not sure. Um, you talked about the APO responses, mm -hmm. somewhere between 5.2 and 10.4%. I would love to know what the other what the other options in, outside of knocking on doors of neighbors to get input, what else would that be? And I heard that we saw the slide about the, you know, if they're either here with PC or they're with the BOCC. Um, but what, what have we not tried? And in, in, if getting APO responses is part of the process that we really think will help with compatibility is one example that was shared today. The other one um, is in that maximum nights. And I think it would be helpful to me as well as we continue this conversation to understand where that number, and Commissioner Lee, you talked about it a little bit, and we hear about that, that asking applicants will Virtually, we've been asking applicants, how did you get that number? Where did you get that number? And some of it has been, well, we've talked to somebody else who went through this process, and they told us that you said it, it was better at 180 or 120 at the very beginning, and right after these regulations became effective in February 2021, which, quite frankly, we didn't have a great basis for, and mm -hmm. I personally didn't have the understanding of what happened prior to 2018 and, and why these amendments, et cetera, et cetera. So I just... I think just for us to process that, it would be really helpful to understand um, not necessarily when, but how that number is and can we agree on right. how we're going to define that for the actual criteria um, in regards to the, the maximum nights. The other one, I, I just want to addition that talking with other commissioners around the state, specifically in mountain communities who are looking at short-term rentals, who are looking at commercialization, at taxation, uh, et cetera, the, 
question of geographic overlay to me is also a piece that could be, however we include that in this process and potential amendments, seems like it would make more sense and give us a, another ability for the same cases that Commissioner Levy was talking about, but also from hearing folks, from folks who um, the expectation and the, the, the long-term standing of sections of Boulder County where uh, the different rentals just already exist. The other piece that, is because somebody brought it up, was the limit on license. And I, I do think that it should be a conversation. I wasn't part of that conversation previously. But what it does prohibit when we put a one license person, if the goal of the license is about safety, then I, I think we should have a conversation about do we put a limit of one license specifically for, and we've heard from an applicant, or maybe it was a different conversation I had with somebody who already owned, because their family already owned more than one property in Boulder County. Um, and so all we're, potentially all we end up doing is having a license, an, one licensed property where we know about the safety and, and all the emergency access, et cetera, and then we have another property who they're just not gonna go through the process. And so I, again, I don't know what the conversation was prior to, but I think we need to be cognizant of not inviting that, but is there a grandfather process? Is there something for families who already own properties versus corporations? And I understand that concern. So those are some of my questions and responses. Yeah, I, the, what I recall from the one license conversation was we didn't, one of the reasons was we didn't want uh, this to become a business for people where they would run a bunch of short-term rentals, like which is going on in numerous places in Colorado and our friends in other counties and or county organization we're involved with talk about it all the time. And so that, and yeah, it's not a perfect solution. I mean, that's the way the state you did liquor stores and you'd see family members, each one owning one, but it's still limited it to four or three or two and not 20. That, uh, that's some background on that. So oh, were you going to respond, Ethan? Sorry. I can try to unpack just a little of that real quick if you'd yeah. like, but I'm happy to also just hear what you've got to say. Well, I was going to pick up on another thread, so go ahead on that one. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, that's kind of another challenge that's associated with these land use reviews and the licensing thing, right, is, is we realized that there was a process before the amendments took place to get people licensed to have vacation or to have a short-term dwelling rental. Right, but when we looked at it, it seemed like a lot of people hadn't gone through that process. And so when you draft the new amendment and you create a new process, a new land use review process, how do you incentivize people to go through that process rather than rent illegally, right? And so what can you do to make that process a, a little bit easier? Um, fortunately, I think this is being recorded, so I can go back and, and take and you know uh, consider some of the, the things that you said, Commissioner Lochamin. But I, I, I do. There were a couple of things that I, I noted specifically that I think we've already started to try and think about, um, and so you know that's that's good at guidance to have. I have one quick question about licenses. Um, Sam brought up the idea of having the nearby approved or licensed uses as part of the review process, which I agree would be really useful. But are licenses public today? Is there a listing of licensed properties? Is it easy to figure out? Uh, oh. I, I just searched for a few minutes. I couldn't find it. Other than looking at back at special use docket numbers and the planning website, which is no one's idea of an easy way of finding it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they are on, the, on our website. They're not on the short-term rental website. They are on our online application website under the statistics. So it's a, an Excel spreadsheet that you can pull and look to see which ones okay. are all licensed. Great. So, the other the, the comment I had just briefly about the process was, um, I think to echo what people said earlier about the Planning Commission review and the, and the multiple hearings, um, I don't particularly think that having two different public comment periods is that useful, except in, in one way, which is that the Planning Commission hearing that happens first is the one chance that the public has to comment and for the applicant to respond to those comments, mm -hmm. either in their written response uh, or in their next hearing for the county commissioners. So there is value in having some kind of open dialogue with neighbors that is not the APO process and is not just one-on-one -on -one communication. Doing that in public and having a chance to respond to that does seem like it has a chance to improve the application. I'd be interested in knowing how many of those apps that you reviewed did change based on that commentary between the PC meeting and the commissioner's meeting. Because if, if it's not many, then that's not really a very valuable chance to, they're saying, great that you said that, but I'm gonna stick with the same application. Right, um, I think between PC and 
the OCC, there was no change. Generally, the changes happened before that point. The one that I, I can recall is the one where the applicant reduced the total number of nights to 150 days a year because they had conversations with their neighbors. Um, you know, even I think on the materials on our website, when we tell folks that you might have to engage in a special use review process, we generally let you know that, like, hey, you might want to talk to your neighbors because they, they're going to have a say in this process. And if you can clear things beforehand, you can address those issues before they come up. Um, like I said, it's probably pretty difficult to determine why people aren't responding to the information that we send them. But, you know, one of the things I tried to consider is, well, how many people are showing up to the hearings? And it generally are, it looks like what we're um, seeing for the responses. And so that, that right there might tell us something, but I have to look a little bit further to tell you what. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I think I addressed that. Did I did I address that? Yeah, well sure. Yeah, thanks. And, and, I just, and I, I, nobody's really in charge of this meeting because you all invited us. But I just want to do a time check um, because some some folks have meetings. We usually go for about ten hours in these meetings. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll we'll can, join can you I, after uh, yeah. <laughs> ninety minutes. I just have one more quick thing, sure. and I I do realize we're just about out of time. And before we do run out of time, I just want to say thank you to the Planning Commission for everything you do. I read all your you know, your recommendations and, um, and, you know, really want to thank you for all this, the seat time you put in for us, which helps us. But so my question is a follow up on a, a question that came from the left side of the dais, and I don't recall who, who asked it about um, recent people who have recently purchased properties versus have owned them for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I we are concerned about with the housing stock issue and the financialization of housing in general is, you know, having people come in, see an investment opportunity, buy the thing, um, and then put it up for short-term rental. I, I think it's worth giving some thought to whether we want to say you have to own this property for a certain amount of time before it's eligible. Um, you know, there are immediate trade-offs that come to mind and unintended consequences and we hear from the lovely families that bought their dream home and they can't quite afford it and they want to rent it out to make it affordable and I realize that might be a problem but I, I think it's something we might want to just take a look at we may ultimately not go that direction but um, you know it, I, I think I think if we wanted to make this an opportunity, one, for people to come into compliance with something they're already doing, and two, um, to allow properties to continue to be used as they've been used, but do so on a more affordable basis, trying to limit the attractiveness of Colorado cabins to out-of-state investors is, is something we could look at. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to pull that thread right. The thing that when I, the first thing that comes to mind when I start thinking about what are the other policy options, what are the other regulatory options that, you, you know, we might not be able to address through the land use code, but we might be able to just make apparent is, you know, do we create any equity concerns when we do these things, right? And if so, what are they among other concerns, right? So that's something I'm trying to keep in front of mind, but I'm happy to, happy to kind of pull that thread uh, as well and see where it takes us. Um, I, I'd like to make a request for more data as well. I mean, speaking about housing stock and affordability, I'm having a hard time understanding what the directionality and the impact of any of these short-term rental and vacation rentals um, has on um, either housing stock or affordability. I mean, certainly for primary dwelling, there's arguments on both sides. You know, you, you can afford it because you can rent out some of it. Um, and then, you know, there's investors who maybe take away, um, you know, housing stock. But I, I think there's, you know, a lot of jurisdictions have done different things with short-term rentals. I think Denver's basically outlawed any primary or non-primary uh, short-term rentals. And then you have Estes Park with, like, limits on the number of short-term rentals permits avail licenses available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think we need PhD thesis level conclusions, but... Um, I need, you know, it, it, I just don't understand, you know, are we making things worse, making things better? What, you know, how much worse, how much better? Uh, it'd be good to get a handle of this. And then we have those three different categories too. They, they seem to 
you know, I think primary, um, it's, it seems a little more comfortable to allow someone who lives in the house to rent it out for a certain number of time, uh, nights, but then you know, secondary and vacation rental, I getting, it's, it's hard for me to understand you know, how big of an impact, especially if it's a, like a traditionally touristy area in the first place. Right, and, and I think that was kind of the challenge that came up during the first, um, during the, the 2019 iteration of this, and Commissioner Jones addressed it. Um, it. Like, there are some properties that are seasonal, right? And they may be better suited for vacation rentals. And I think um, when we took a look at, well, what about these properties where we'll allow a primary dwelling short-term rental? The person lives in that property, and if they are a person who's living and working in Boulder County, but they also want to rent a room, I mean, like, that's a pretty good economic outcome, right? Because you're, you're having somebody who lives and works in the county, they're also like using a scarce resource and it's providing them with a benefit and it's providing other benefits. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you start looking at like the vacation rentals and the secondary dwelling short-term rentals. But I, I, I will promise that I cannot give you a PhD level uh, <laughs> dissertation on this, but I, I will try and, you know, at least you know, be clear about what we've looked at, what other communities are doing, what we're seeing just broadly, what can be applied to Boulder County, um, how we might apply it. And, and I generally try and put in caveats where I can of like, hey, take this with a grain of salt because this is how we got here. Um, and so, yeah, I'm happy to try and include those as well. Uh, on the data front, I think something that would actually be helpful would be if we could have some numbers on uh, I forget the exact requirement or restriction for the primary dwelling only, mm -hmm. um, but I, is it, I think it's basically a subdivision. You can have a, a primary dwelling short-term rental. You can have one in, in the county. Right. There's but, no restriction. But the areas where you can only have a primary dwelling okay. rental, um, if, if we knew essentially how what numbers of housing stock, of the housing stock, of the... Uh, I forget what Dale said now, 30,000? 20, 20,000. I said 30,000. I was wrong. Okay. Um, so what percentage of the 20,000 are restricted to only a primary dwelling short-term rental? And what what percentage of that is available for, for longer term? I mean, overall, it seems like the numbers of licenses and applications we have are pretty low. Um, and then there's the question of, well, what's being licensed and what's not. To me, that's not a question of this ordinance. It's a question of enforcement. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, what might be easier, because the primary dwelling short-term rental is permitted in, in all zoning districts, it might be easier to just give you an updated version of where you can have a vacation rental and where you can't have a vacation rental, you know, sure. assuming that it is eligible and meets the requirements. Again, it's kind of a challenge that it comes down to the diversity of the, the county, right? The mountains, it might be a more seasonal home. In the plains, it might be something that has a lower vacancy rate. And that just might be a function of a couple of different things. Right. And, and I guess what I'm curious about there is not just where, but what are the actual numbers of homes that are available for vacation? That yeah, I, I can try and work that out. Are we at time? Was there a time limit on this? So my understanding was that there was a hard stop at 5 p.m. If this is the uh, if this is the time where we all want to end, that's that's I, I'm. I I have yet another meeting. Yeah. <laughs> after this, a Dr. Cog meeting. But so if, I, uh, it was calendar. I think for 4:30 to um, for our calendars. Or if yeah. if that's the case, um, if we can just show well, the next okay, step slide I, real quick, I'm happy to. Um, just make everybody aware that there are additional steps coming on, and then um, you know these are at, they're, we're anticipating some public engagement potentially in November if we can fit it in, and then like I said at the beginning, BOCC um, shooting for December or January. Some other mechanical things will happen during that time period, but this is it. But I appreciate you all taking the time; it's been very helpful. Thank Thanks you. for your hard work. Thank you, Thank you all. Is, is there a PC review meeting or only a BOCC review meeting? Um, I think that it's uh, a public meeting with the BOCC that was based off of what I saw in the uh, press release for this um, for this uh, review. Um, but that's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. Just, 
Uh, before we go, I think we need to adjourn our planning commission meeting. So do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to motion. adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 So I, I just want to thank all of you as well. Uh, you do great work. You read your stuff. You go. You dig deep, and you provide us a lot of you know, good information. So I just thank so much. Thank you. Great to meet you all. Thank you. Yes. Yeah.